Chapter 5. Engine Starting Systems. Introduction. Most aircraft engines, reciprocating or turbine, require help during the starting process. Hence, this device is termed the starter. A starter is an electromechanical mechanism capable of developing large amounts of mechanical energy that can be applied to an engine, causing it to rotate. Reciprocating engines need only to be turned through at a relatively slow speed until the engine starts and turns on its own. Once the reciprocating engine has fired and started, the starter is disengaged and has no further function until the next start. In the case of a turbine engine, the starter must turn the engine up to a speed that provides enough airflow through the engine for fuel to be ignited. Then, the starter must continue to help the engine accelerate to a self-sustaining speed. Turbine engine starters have a critical role in starting of the engine. 5-1 If the starter turns the turbine engine up to a self-sustaining speed, the engine start process will not be successful. There are only a few types or methods used to turn the engine. Almost all reciprocating engines use a form of electric motor geared to the engine. Modern turbine engines use electric motors, starter slash generators, electric motor and a generator in the same housing, and air turbine starters. Air turbine starters are driven by compressed air through a turbine wheel that is mechanically connected through reduction gears to one of the engine's compressors, generally the highest pressure compressor. Reciprocating engine starting systems. In the early stages of aircraft development, relatively low-powered reciprocating engines were started by pulling the propeller through a part of a revolution by hand. Difficulty was often experienced in cold weather starting when lubricating oil temperatures were near the congealing point. In addition, the magneto systems delivered a weak starting spark at the very low cranking speeds. This was often compensated for by providing a hot spark using such ignition system devices as the boost recoil, induction vibrator, or impulse coupling. Some small, low-powered aircraft which use hand cranking of the propeller, or propping, for starting are still being operated. For general instructions on starting this type of aircraft, refer to the Aviation Maintenance Technician, General Handbook. Chapter 11, Safety, Ground Operations, and Servicing. Throughout the development of the aircraft reciprocating engine from the earliest use of starting systems to the present, a number of different starter systems have been used. Most reciprocating engine starters are the direct cranking electric type. A few older model aircraft are still equipped with inertia starters. Thus, only a brief description of these starting systems is included in this section. Inertia starters. There are three general types of inertia starters. Hand, electric, and combination hand and electric. The operation of all types of inertia starters depends on the kinetic energy stored in a rapidly rotating flywheel for cranking ability. Kinetic energy is energy possessed by a body by virtue of its state of motion, which may be movement along a line or spinning action. In the inertia starter, energy is stored slowly during an energizing process by a manual hand crank, or electrically with a small motor. The flywheel and movable gears of a combination hand electric inertia starter are shown in figure 5-1. The electrical circuit for an electric inertia starter is shown in figure 5-2. During the energizing of the starter, all movable parts within it, including the flywheel, are set in motion. After the starter has been fully energized, it is engaged to the crankshaft of the engine by a cable pulled manually or by a meshing solenoid that is energized electrically. When the starter is engaged, or meshed, flywheel energy is transferred to the engine through sets of reduction gears and a torque overload release clutch. Figure 5-3, Direct Cranking Electric Starter. The most widely used starting system on all types of reciprocating engines utilizes the direct cranking electric starter. This type of starter provides instant and continual cranking when energized. The direct cranking electric starter consists basically of an electric motor, reduction gears, and an automatic engaging and disengaging mechanism that is operated through an adjustable torque overload release clutch. A typical circuit for a direct cranking electric starter is shown in figure 5-4. The engine is cranked directly when the starter solenoid is closed. As shown in figure 5-4, the main cables leading from the starter to the battery are heavy duty to carry the high current flow, which may be in a range from as high as 350 amperes to 100 amperes, amps, depending on the starting torque required. The use of solenoids and heavy flywheel torque overload release clutch, centrifugal clutch, starter driving jaw, hand crank adapter hard steel insert. Figure 5-1. Combination hand and electric inertia starter. 5-2. Battery control switch. Starting solenoid. Battery relay. Enter. Starter. Inertia plus bus. Mesh. Starter control switch. Engaging solenoid. Figure 5-2. Electric inertia starting circuit. Springs. Barrel. Flywheel, starter driving jaw, discs, mounting flange, crank socket engaging level, figure 5-3, torque overload release clutch, wiring with a remote control switch reduces overall cable weight and total circuit voltage drop. The typical starter motor is a 12- or 24-volt, series wound motor that develops high starting torque. The torque of the motor is transmitted through reduction gears to the overload release clutch. Typically, this action actuates a helically splint shaft moving the starter jaw outward. To engage the engine cranking jaw before the starter jaw begins to rotate. After the engine reaches a predetermined speed, the starter automatically disengages. The schematic in figure 5-5 provides a pictorial arrangement of an entire starting system for a light twin engine aircraft. 
Direct cranking electric starting system for large reciprocating engines. In a typical high horsepower reciprocating engine starting system, the direct cranking electric starter consists of two basic components, a motor assembly and a gear section. The gear section is bolted to the drive end of the motor to form a complete unit. The motor assembly consists of the armature and motor pinion assembly, the end bell assembly, and the motor housing assembly. The motor housing also acts as the magnetic yoke for the field structure. The starter motor is a non-reversible, series interpole motor. Its speed varies directly with the applied voltage, and inversely with the load. The starter gear section consists of an external housing with an integral mounting flange, planetary gear reduction, a sun and integral gear assembly, a torque limiting, battery solenoid, starter solenoid, bus, plus, starter, battery switch, starter switch, figure 5-4. Typical starting circuit using a direct cranking electric starter. To auxiliary igniter device, 5-3. Left magnetos, right magnetos, starter vibrator, solenoid actuating voltage, circuit breaker, 24 volts DC input, starter switch left, starter switch right, ammeter shunt, 0, minus 30 plus 30, plus 60 dash 60, AMP, left engine starter, solenoid actuating voltage, 24 volts DC input, heavy current to starter, left starter solenoid, bus, Ground through switch actuates battery solenoid auxiliary voltage input. Heavy current to starter. Right starter solenoid. Battery solenoid. Battery switch. External power receptacle. Right engine starter. Figure 5-5. Engine starting schematic for a light twin engine aircraft. Clutch and a John cone assembly. Figure 5-6. When the starter circuit is closed, the torque developed in the starter motor is transmitted to the starter jaw through the reduction gear train and clutch. The starter gear train converts the high-speed low torque of the motor to the low-speed high torque required to crank the engine. In the gear section, the motor pinion engages the gear on the intermediate counter shaft. Figure 5-6 The pinion of the counter shaft engages the internal gear. The internal gear is an integral part of the sun gear assembly and is rigidly attached to the sun gear shaft. The sun gear drives three planet gears that are part of the planetary gear assembly. The individual planet gear shafts are supported by the planetary carrying arm. A barrel-like part shown in Figure 5-6 the carrying arm transmits torque from the planet gears to the starter jaw as follows. 1. The cylindrical portion of the carrying arm is splint longitudinally around the inner surface. 2. Mating splints are cut on the exterior surface of the cylindrical part of the starter jaw. 3. The jaw slides fore and aft inside the carrying arm to engage and disengage with the engine. The three planet gears also engage the surrounding internal teeth on the six steel clutch plates. Figure 5-6 These plates are interleaved with externally splint bronze clutch plates that engage the sides of the housing, preventing them from turning. The proper pressure is maintained upon the clutch pack by a clutch spring retainer assembly. A cylindrical traveling nut inside the starter jaw extends and retracts the jaw. Spiral jaw engaging splints around the inner wall of the nut mate with similar splints cut on an extension of the sun gear shaft. Figure 5-6 Being splint in this fashion, rotation of the shaft forces the nut out and the nut carries the jaw with it. A jaw spring around the traveling nut carries the jaw with the nut and tends to keep a conical clutch surface around the inner wall of the jaw head seated against a similar surface around the underside of the nut head. A return spring is installed on the sun gear shaft extension between a shoulder. Formed by the 5-4 Clutch spring retainer steel clutch Bronze clutch plates Internal gear Motor pinion Motor shaft Intermediate counter shaft Planetary gear Planetary carrying arm Jaw engaging splint Jaw spring Return spring Sun gear shaft extension and jaw stop retainer nut Starter jaw Conical clutch surface traveling nut Sun gear Counter shaft pinion. Figure 5-6. Starter gear section. Splints around the inner wall of the traveling nut. And a jaw stop retaining nut on the end of the shaft. Because the conical clutch surfaces of the traveling nut. And the starter jaw are engaged by jaw spring pressure. The two parts tend to rotate at the same speed. However, the sun gear shaft extension turns six times faster than the jaw. The spiral splints on it are cut left hand. And the sun gear shaft extension. Turning to the right in relation to the jaw, forces the traveling nut and the jaw out from the starter its full travel, about 5 sixteenths inches in approximately 12 degrees of rotation of the jaw. The jaw moves out until it is stopped either by engagement with the engine, or by the jaw stop retaining nut. The traveling nut continues to move slightly beyond the limit of jaw travel, just enough to relieve some of the spring pressure on the conical clutch surfaces. As long as the starter continues to rotate, there is just enough pressure on the conical clutch surfaces to provide torque on the spiral splints that balance most of the pressure of the jaw spring. If the engine fails to start, the starter jaw does not retract since the starter mechanism provides no retracting force. However, when the engine fires and the engine jaw overruns the starter jaw, the sloping ramps of the jaw teeth force the starter jaw into the starter against the jaw spring pressure. This disengages the conical clutch surfaces entirely, and the jaw spring pressure forces the traveling nut to slide in along the spiral splints until the conical clutch surfaces are again in contact. When the starter and engine are both running, 
there is an engaging force keeping the jaws in contact that continue until the starter is de-energized. However, the rapidly moving engine jaw teeth, striking the slowly moving starter jaw teeth, hold the starter jaw disengaged. As soon as the starter comes to rest, the engaging force is removed and the small return spring throws the starter jaw into its fully retracted position where it remains until the next start. When the starter jaw first engages the engine jaw, the motor armature has had time to reach considerable speed because of its high starting torque. The sudden engagement of the moving starter jaw with the stationary engine jaw would develop forces sufficiently high enough to severely damage the engine or the starter were it not for the plates in the clutch pack that slip, when the engine torque exceeds the clutch slipping torque. 5-5 In normal direct cranking action, the internal steel gear clutch plates are held stationary by the friction of the bronze plates with which they are interleaved. When the torque imposed by the engine exceeds the clutch setting, however, the internal gear clutch plates rotate against the clutch friction, allowing the planet gears to rotate while the planetary carrying arm and the jaw remain stationary. When the engine reaches the speed that the starter is trying to achieve, the torque drops off to a value less than the clutch setting, the internal gear clutch plates are again held stationary, and the jaw rotates at the speed that the motor is attempting to drive it. The starter control switches are shown schematically in figure 5-7. The engine selector switch must be positioned and the starter switch in the safety switch, wired in series, must be closed before the starter can be energized. Current is supplied to the starter control circuit through a circuit breaker labeled starter, primer, and induction vibrator. Figure 5-7 when the engine selector switch is in position for the engine start, closing the starter energies is the starter relay located in the engine notch L area. Energizing the starter relay completes the power circuit to the starter motor. The current necessary for this heavy load is taken directly from the master bus through the starter bus cable. All starting systems have operating time limits because of the high energy use during cranking or rotation of the engine. These limits are referred to as starter limits and must be observed. Or overheating and damage of the starter occurs. After energizing the starter for one minute, it should be allowed to cool for at least one minute. After a second or subsequent cranking period of one minute, it should cool for five minutes. Direct cranking electric starting system for small aircraft. Most small. Reciprocating engine aircraft employ a direct cranking electric starting system. Some of these systems are automatically engaged starting systems, while others are manually engaged. Manually engaged starting systems used on many older, small aircraft employ a manually operated overrunning clutch drive pinion to transmit power from an electric starter motor to a crankshaft starter drive gear. Figure 5-8. A knob or handle on the instrument panel is connected by a flexible control to a lever on the starter. This lever shifts the starter drive pinion into the engaged position, and closes the starter switch contacts, when the starter knob or handle is pulled. Ignition boost switch. To induction vibrator. Bus. To primer. Starter primer and induction vibrator. Primer switch. Start switch safely switch. Off 1. 2. 3. 4. Engine selector switch. Starter relay. Starter bus. Starter motor. Engine no. 1. Master bus. To prop deasing relay. Starter bus cable. To feathering pump relay. Firewall junction box. Figure 5-7. Starter control circuit. 5-6. The starter lever is attached to a return spring that returns the lever, and the flexible control to the off position. When the engine starts, the overrunning action of the clutch protects the starter drive pinion until the shift lever can be released to disengage the pinion. For the typical unit, there is a specified length of travel for the starter gear pinion. Figure 5-8. It is important that the starter lever move the starter pinion gear this proper distance before the adjustable lever stud contacts the starter switch. The automatic, or remote solenoid engaged. Starting systems employ an electric starter mounted on an engine adapter. A starter solenoid is activated by either a push button, or turning the ignition key on the instrument panel. When the solenoid is activated, its contacts close and electrical energy energizes the starter motor. Initial rotation of the starter motor engages the starter through an overrunning clutch in the starter adapter, which incorporates worm reduction gears. Some engines incorporate an automatic starting system that employs an electric starter motor mounted on a right angle drive adapter. As the starter motor is electrically energized, the adapter worm shaft and gear engage the starter shaft gear by means of a spring and clutch assembly. The shaft gear, in turn, rotates the crank shaft. When the engine begins to turn on its own power, the clutch spring disengages from the shaft gear. The starter adapter uses a worm drive gear shaft and worm gear to transfer torque from the starter motor to the clutch assembly. Figure 5-9 As the worm gear rotates the worm wheel and clutch spring, the clutch spring is tightened around the drum of the starter shaft gear. As the shaft gear turns, torque is transmitted directly to the crankshaft gear. Flexible starter control rod. Return spring. Adjusting stud. Starter switch. Starter lever. 9 sixteenths, 1 sixteenth, clearance. Starter drive pinion. Figure 5-8. Starter level controls and adjustment. Starter adapter housing. Starter motor. Bearing worm gear. Starter shaft gear worm wheel. Clutch spring. Figure 5-9. Starter Adapter 5-7 Other engines use a starter that drives a ring gear mounted to the propeller hub, 
Figure 5-10, it uses an electric motor and a drive gear that engages as the motor is energized and spins the gear, which moves out and engages the ring gear on the propeller hub cranking the engine for start. Figure 5-11, as the engine starts, the starter drive gear is spun back by the engine turning, which disengages the drive gear. Figure 5-12, the starter motors on small aircraft also have operational limits with cool down times that should be observed. Starter ring gear mounted on propeller hub plate. Propeller. Figure 5-10, starter ring gear mounted on the propeller hub. Reciprocating Engine Starting System Maintenance Practices Most starting system maintenance practices include replacing the starter motor brushes and brush springs, cleaning dirty commutators, and turning down burned or out-of-round starter commutators. As a rule, starter brushes should be replaced when worn down to approximately one-half the original length. Brush spring tension should be sufficient to give brushes a good firm contact with the commutator. Brush leads should be unbroken and lead terminal screws tight. A glazed or dirty starter commutator can be cleaned by holding a strip of double zero sandpaper or a brush seating stone against the commutator as it is turned. The sandpaper or stone should be moved back and forth across the commutator, to avoid wearing a groove. Emery paper or carborundum should never be used for this purpose because of their possible shorting action. Roughness, out of roundness, or high mica conditions are reasons for turning down the commutator. In the case of a high mica condition, the mica should be undercut after the turning operation is accomplished. Refer to FAA H8083-30, Aviation Maintenance Technician. General for a review of high mica commutators and motors. The drive gear should be checked for wear along with the ring gear. The electrical connections should be checked for looseness and corrosion. Also, check the security of the mounting of the housing of the starter. Troubleshooting small aircraft starting systems. The troubleshooting procedures listed in figure 5-13 are typical of those used to isolate malfunctions in small aircraft starting systems. Gas turbine engine starters. Gas turbine engines are started by rotating the high pressure compressor. On dual spool, axial flow engines, the high. Mounting bolts and alignment pin. Starter drive gear. Electrical connection. Figure 5-11. Starter drive gear mounting holes and electrical connector. 5-8. Starter ring gear mounted on propeller hub. Starter gear. Figure 5-12. Engine starter mounted on the engine. Pressure compressor and N1 turbine system is only rotated by the starter. To start a gas turbine engine, it is necessary to accelerate the compressor to provide sufficient air to support combustion in the combustion section, or burners. Once ignition and fuel has been introduced and the light off has occurred, the starter must continue to assist the engine until the engine reaches a self-sustaining speed. The torque supplied by the starter must be in excess of the torque required to overcome compressor inertia and the friction loads of the engine's compressor. Figure 5-14 illustrates a typical starting sequence for a gas turbine engine, regardless of the type of starter employed. As soon as the starter has accelerated the compressor sufficiently to establish airflow through the engine, the ignition is turned on followed by the fuel. The exact sequence of the starting procedure is important, since there must be sufficient airflow through the engine to support combustion before the fuel-air mixture is ignited. At low engine cranking speeds, the fuel flow rate is not sufficient to enable the engine to accelerate. For this reason, the starter continues to crank the engine until after self-accelerating speed has been attained. If assistance from the starter were cut off below the self-accelerating speed, the engine would either fail to accelerate to idle speed, or might even decelerate because it could not produce sufficient energy to sustain rotation, or to accelerate during the initial phase of the starting cycle. The starter must continue to assist the engine considerably above the self-accelerating speed to avoid a delay in the starting cycle, which would result in a hot or hung false start or a combination of both. At the proper points in the sequence, the starter and ignition are automatically cut off. The basic types of starters that are in current use for gas turbine engines are direct current, DC, electric motor, starter slash generators, and the air turbine type of starters. Small aircraft troubleshooting procedures. Probable cause isolation procedure remedy. Starter will not operate. Starter motor runs but does not turn crankshaft. Starter drags. Starter excessively noisy. Defective master switch or circuit. Defective starter switch or switch circuit. Starter lever does not activate switch. Defective starter. Starter lever adjusted to activate switch without engaging pinion with crankshaft gear. Defective overrunning clutch or drive. Damaged starter pinion gear or crankshaft gear. Low battery. Starter switch or relay contacts burned or dirty. Defective starter. Dirty. Worn commutator. Worn starter pinion. Worn or broken teeth on crankshaft gears. Check master circuit. Check switch circuit continuity. Check starter lever adjustment. Check through items above. If another cause is not apparent, starter is defective. Check starter lever adjustment. Remove starter and check starter drive and overrunning clutch. Remove and check pinion gear and crankshaft gear. Check battery. Check contacts. Check starter brushes. Brush spring tension for solder thrown on brush cover. Clean and check visually. Remove and examine pinion. Remove starter and turn over engine by hand to examine crankshaft gear. Repair circuit. Replace switch or wires. Adjust starter lever in accordance with manufacturer's instructions. Remove and repair or replace starter. Adjust starter lever in accordance with manufacturer's instructions.
Replace defective parts. Replace defective parts. Charge or replace battery. Replace with serviceable unit. Repair or replace starter. Turn down commutator. Replace starter drive. Replace crankshaft gear. Figure 5-13. Small aircraft troubleshooting procedures. 5-9. Peak starting act. Exhaust gas temperature versus time. Idle act. Compressor RPM versus time. Compressor RPM. Engine attains idle RPM. Starter cuts out ignition off engine attains self-accelerating speed. Ignition on. Engine lights up. Exhaust gas temperature. Degrees Celsius. Fuel on. Ect rise and the light up. Time. Seconds. Figure 5-14. Typical gas turbine engine starting sequence. Many types of turbine starters have included several different methods for turning the engine for starting. Several methods have been used but most of these have given way to electric or air turbine starters. An air impingement starting system, which is sometimes used on small engines, consists of jets of compressed air piped to the inside of the compressor or turbine case so that the jet air blast is directed onto the compressor or turbine rotor blades, causing them to rotate. A typical cartridge slash pneumatic turbine engine starter may be operated as an ordinary air turbine starter from a ground-operated air supply or an engine cross-bleed source. It may also be operated as a cartridge starter. Figure 5-15. To accomplish a cartridge start, a cartridge is first placed in the breech cap. The breech is then closed on the breech chamber by means of the breech handle and then rotated a partial turn to engage the lugs between the two breech sections. The cartridge is ignited by applying voltage through the connector at the end of the breech handle. Upon ignition, the cartridge begins to generate gas. The gas is forced out of the breech to the hot gas nozzles that are directed toward the buckets on the turbine rotor, and rotation is produced via the overboard exhaust collector. Before reaching the nozzle, the hot gas passes an outlet leading to the relief valve. This valve directs hot gas to the turbine, bypassing the hot gas nozzle, as the pressure rises above the preset maximum. Thus, the pressure of the gas within the hot gas circuit is maintained at the optimum level. The fuel-slash-air combustion starter was used to start gas turbine engines by using the combustion energy of jet fuel and compressed air. The starter consists of a turbine-driven power unit and auxiliary fuel, air, and ignition systems. Operation of this type starter is, in most installations, fully automatic. Actuation of a single switch causes the starter to fire and accelerate the engine from rest to starter cutoff speed. Relief valve. Hot gas nozzles. Gear shaft. Turbine exhaust ring over running sprag clutch. Flyweight. Cartridge. Switch. Splin shaft. Switch actuating rod. Breech cap breech handle. Exhaust from turbine and fan. Figure 5-15. Cartridge slash pneumatic starter schematic. 5-10. Compressed air inlet. Turbine rotor. 